Good morning and welcome to this presentation. Today we will focus on the key factor for aesthetics on implant supported restoration. And uh, it's a real pleasure to make this presentation together with my friend and colleague Luca Gobato. Hi Gianluca, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me uh, as well. Okay, we have a lot of material to talk about today uh, as uh, aesthetics uh, significantly and implant restoration significantly changed in the recent years. And we will try to be fast and give you a lot of information um, within 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, implantology changed significantly in the last uh, decades. And since the uh, first cases that have been treated with implants, we made a lot of big steps and these are the first type of treatments that we were able to uh, provide to our patients in the 80s, in the 90s. Most of them were full arch rehabilitation of edentulous patients. And as you can see on these slides, uh, we were providing patients with fixed restoration, giving them their dream to have the ability to chew on uh, uh, fixed dentition. So these patients were not looking a lot into aesthetics, but they were focusing mostly on the achievement of uh, a fixed restoration in order to be able to socialize and especially to chew, to bite, to have a good meal. Most recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, the focus shifted significantly from the uh, goal of mastication and so from a functional goal into a much more aesthetic related goal. So implantology now in the aesthetic zone especially is uh, uh, changed significantly and what we are trying to give to our patients is natural uh, uh, results with the implant supported restoration as you can see on this picture um, that are extremely similar to natural dentition. And of course, I have to say that uh, it's not as easy as it seems. These are some cases that presented to our attention with a, a disaster. So with a huge aesthetic problem uh, that most of the time is also a functional problem. And I really believe that when we are focusing into these cases, we have to spend time to make a proper diagnosis. So all our treatments and all our implant treatments starts from a proper diagnosis. If you actually look into this picture on the, on the, on next to me uh, and you look at the, into this, the, these teeth, we can definitely notice that uh, we have nice white a nice white component with two nice teeth that have been made on implants. And we can focus on two different aspects in a white um, uh, zone and in a pink zone. For what I can say as a prostodontist, <clears throat> we have a lot of possibility in the improvement of these uh, restorations uh, thanks to the works of good dental technicians and thanks to the works of uh, uh, good uh, restorative dentists. But uh, we can achieve a good result only if we can play with a lot of soft tissue underneath. That's why to me it's extremely important to work tightly with the periodontist uh, like Luca, who can really give me a good envelope in which position my restorations. And I really think, Luca, that we should uh, uh, talk a little bit about what uh, uh, you have to do to uh, provide a good environment for the restorative dentist in order to achieve a good result. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I think that, uh, uh, as you said, that the uh, ultimate goal of implant dentistry is absolutely to mimic the nature of the natural appearance of the dentition. So it's um, extremely important, as you mentioned, uh, to focus uh, on the size, the shape, the position and the color of our restoration. But what really makes the uh, natural appearance of our implant supported restoration is uh, the peri-implant soft tissue compatibility with the surrounding uh, gingiva and the mucosa. So it's it's extremely important to um, restore the uh, implant housing so where the uh, this, and to manage correctly the surrounding hard and soft tissue around the implants in order to provide a <clears throat> better uh, situation uh, for the prosthodontist to work with and to achieve a good results. 
That's why we introduced the terms uh, peri-implant biotype. Uh, meaning what? Meaning uh, that we have to consider the biotype uh, in terms of thickness and quality of the hard and soft tissue around our implants. Of course, what is extremely related with the implant biotype is the implant position itself. Because uh, <coughs> differently from the natural dentition, uh, we have a moment in, in which we will decide which are going to be the thickness of our implant of our of the tissue of the uh, vestibule aspect of our implant is uh, when we are going to position our implants and that's why for example a, a nice study of uh, Homley Wang um, talking about the influence of tissue biotype related to the implant aesthetics uh, is uh, uh, telling us exactly which are the steps for us that we have to keep in mind in order to achieve a good aesthetics uh, in terms of thickness of the tissue uh, of the buccal aspect of our implants. And these aspects are related of course to the implant position which is the starting point, extremely important. We can probably play a little bit with the implant diameter, with the dimension of the implant. And then, of course, we have to work with a good rest uh, restorative dentist, a good prosthodontist, in order to focus on, the, on those steps from the provisional to the definitive restoration that will increase the, uh, uh, the soft tissue uh, di dimension of the of the of the tissue on the, around our implants, which Gianluca will uh, uh, focus uh, uh, lately on, uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. So, as you mentioned, uh, the diagnosis, the starting point is extremely important and uh, I would like to uh, focus a little bit on this uh, article, which is uh, a, a, a key point article. This is uh, a, a highly uh, quoted article worldwide by uh, Funato Ishikawa and uh, Salama, which was published uh, in um, 2007. This article identified four different classes of uh, clinical situation which are uh, different from each other uh, on the <coughs> and the classification is based on the quantity of the buccal plate uh, which we have after the extraction of the tooth. So we identify class 1 and class 2 as the two easiest classes to treat, to treat with the uh, 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 for example, immediate implants because we have uh, adequate quantity of bone on the facial aspect of the uh, alveolus of the pox extraction site and this will allow us for an immediate implant placement in an ideal uh, position, in an ideal bone housing, of course. The difference between class 1 and class 2 is uh, that in class 1 we have even adequate soft tissue thickness, so it will make everything much easier. In class 2 we probably Probably have to think of, uh, um, of increasing the thickness of soft tissue with the connected tissue graft, for example. Instead, on class 3 and class 4, we don't have adequate bone uh, quantity in order to place an immediate implant after the extraction on our teeth because, for example, the, uh, the bone housing can be, the, 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 the buccal plate can be, uh, can, uh, it can be, it can, it can have been destroyed by periodontal or endodont endodontic disease, which has uh, completely resorbed the uh, facial plate. So in this case, in class three, we have a deficient uh, uh, buccal, buccal bone, but the implant position can be established, a correct implant position can be established. So in class three, perhaps we can combine an implant placement with a guided bone regeneration technique. But in class four, is absolutely Absolutely uh, a contraindication if we want to achieve a good, a good aesthetics result and a long lasting uh, implant supported restoration in terms of aesthetics and health of our, um, of our prosthesis. Uh, we need to delay the, the implant placement and uh, um, uh, per, uh, perform a, a guided bone regeneration procedure before thinking of uh, placing our implant if we are facing a, a type 4, a class 4 of our clinical uh, situation. So, uh, most of the time I hear this uh, uh, question from the audience is, uh, but what is the uh, ideal uh, three-dimensional position uh, related to the bone housing? So we have always to think, uh, and uh, I'm glad to have here Gianluca that will discuss this, that uh, the implant position is always dictated by our ideal tooth position. 
So it's extremely important uh, uh, to start from a correct diagnosis from the prosthodontics point of view, uh, in which uh, uh, your restorative dentist will create a wax up from which you uh, can, uh, of course, obtain a radiographic stent. And from the radiographic stent, I'm going to see the planet CJ uh, that your restorative dentist identify, and from the planet CJ, I'm going to identify the, uh, the position of the implant shoulder. And the implant shoulder at, at this point will be related, of course, to the bone resorption. So at, at that point, I know if I'm going to have a minimal resorption or an extensive resorption. And then we can decide if we can augment the bone or to play with the pink ceramic, for example, in order to gain a good balance between what we were talking about, the white aesthetics and the pink aesthetics. So... Uh, Gianluca, which are your key points in order to give me this information on the radiographic stent? Yeah, I think, of course, we have to look at uh, each uh, case uh, at a time because uh, all the situations are different. But uh, <coughs> I think that Luca touched a, a really interesting and crucial point. It is the fact that uh, implantology today must be uh, prosthetically driven. So we need to know where the teeth will be at the end of the restoration prior to starting the restorative procedure. So if you look at this case, for example, that is a, a case in which we have a patient with the missing two central incisor and uh, we are dealing with a young patient with uh, maybe high lip line at smile and the uh, two uh, missing teeth. Of course, the first step is to insert a um, stent that can give us and can give to the patient also an idea of the final restoration. So the situation without the, uh, the stent and with the stent can give us a lot of information. And as Luca was saying, we have to start from certain point and the incisal edge position it means the incisal edge position of number eight and nine in this case, or the incisal edge position of the full arch rehabilitation is the first point that we have to have in mind prior to set all the teeth, as you can see, number eight and nine, uh, that are guiding the implant position. So we have to really keep in mind where is the incisal edge position, because from that we can uh, understand exactly where is the cervical position, so the gingival margin position, and from that point we can make all the measurements for the proper three-dimensional implant placement. Uh, normally we try to utilize uh, stents that are some kind of mock-up to give the patient and to give us an idea of the final restoration, but this stent must be also uh, um, radiopaque in order to have also an image of them, as you can see on the right side of your, of your screen, in which we can uh, uh, put together the informations of the bone envelope and of the tooth. And if we plan the cases carefully, like in these cases, we can go very fast from the beginning of the case till the end of the case with guided surgery, as you can see in this specific case. And the important factor is that in the same time we place the implant, we can also place the definitive abatement of our prosthesis, as you can actually see on this video. And then from the prosthesis, uh, from the uh, abatement of the prosthesis that are definitive abatement, we can um, keep going with immediate occlusal loading, um, as you can see in this case so a provisional restoration that is uh, uh, not loaded, that's very important, impartial edentulism. And uh, in a few months, we can then transfer the information from the provisional restoration into the final restoration. So I really believe that if we spend time, as Luca was saying, in the diagnosis and we plan the case carefully, all the next steps can be extremely uh, fast and can be extremely uh, predictable. From a prosthetic point of view, I think this slide is extremely important because we have to do a lot of steps, uh, but actually the important part is that we relate these steps, these prosthetic procedures to the biologic timeline that, as you can see on, this, uh, on the screen, starts from the moment we extract the tooth or from the moment we start treating an edentulous site and, uh, and in the moment we deliver the final restoration. And of course, we have to maintain the patients long term, so we have to see them uh, in the future. But uh, 
on the, on the, on the timeline of the um, surgical procedure, we have to provide some prosthetic steps. And only if we make all our steps uh, predictable, uh, uh, consistent, we can at the end of the case achieve a result, like in this specific case, that is good after uh, one year from the delivery of the restoration and is still good when we see the patient down the line after five to ten years later on. And uh, what I will try to focus uh, in the next part of the presentation is basically on three different steps in three different moments in which we as prostodontists interact with Luca, so with the periodontist, during the treatment of surgical cases. So from the moment Luca starts working, we can have some procedures that I would say A procedures that uh, are uh, basically uh, made up of the management of the peri-implant soft tissue and we can manage this tissue as you will see through an ovate pontic with an implant that is not yet connected to the oral cavity or with the provisional restoration. Then we can have a second step of procedures that we will say are the B procedures in which we transfer the information of the soft tissue from the uh, mouth of the patient to the dental technicians, so to the dental laboratory. And then we have a C part of our procedures in which we will try to uh, uh, maintain these procedures uh, uh, down the line, like long term, and uh, I, we will focus in the last part of the presentations on uh, the selection of the prosthet prosthetic material for the definitive restorations. And I think that if we consider these steps as three separate steps, we can, uh, in a consistent way, treat our cases in uh, uh, the aesthetic zone. But I believe that we have in this moment make a small step back and go back to the diagnosis and start to see what uh, I think is crucial from a surgical point of view, and Luca will tell us a lot of information, uh, try to identify the different uh, clinical situations that we can face uh, and in which we can put our uh, prosthetic uh, procedures. Absolutely. So, um, Gianluca, as I was mentioned before, uh, the starting point is the diagnosis. So, uh, going back to the article of Nato Salami in Shikawa, uh, we know that if we are facing a class 1 or a class 2 uh, C2 clinical situation, uh, which means that we have intact facial plate and adequate bone in order to place our implant, in my hands, this is always a situation in which uh, I place an immediate implant uh, after the extraction. So which are the key factors, the key point that uh, I try to follow in order uh, to achieve uh, a good result to prepare uh, the clinical situation in order for Gianluca to work with adequate hard and soft tissue. So I normally try to extract the, um, the tooth and to place the implant in an ideal three-dimensional position, which uh, we uh, remember it's always a little bit more palatal than the, um, than the uh, uh, position of our uh, natural uh, tooth, a natural root. So uh, the uh, second key is of course to uh, place uh, a, a um, resorbable material no, or long-term resorbable material such as for example xenograft in the gap between the implant and the buccal plate. Uh, sometimes I uh, hear some authors or other clinicians telling me, well, if I have less than two millimeter of this gap, I perhaps do not need to graft uh, with the um, xenograft or bone substitute materials. Well, in my opinion, if I have less than two millimeter gap between my implant and my facial plate, I perhaps uh, making some mistakes in terms of uh, uh, implant diameter, so I um, probably um, better to go back to a smaller diameter implant or my, the position of my implant is uh, a little bit more toward the buccal aspect of my extraction socket. So, uh, or if it's not even th this the case, I might consider open and flap and graft the 
outside aspect of my buckle plate. And then the third extremely important key, which is very well described in the literature by Joseph Kahn, is the need, the need to use soft tissue augmentation, such as connective tissue graft, in order to increase the thickness of the tissue on the facial aspect of my implants. So looking at this case, for example, I have a, a girl who has a, a car accident who fractured number eight and nine, but uh, unfortunately, uh, while number eight is fractured on the coronal, uh, on the, on, or only on the crown of number eight, on number nine instead uh, is fractured on uh, the root is completely fractured. So at this point, uh, we need to plan for an automatic extraction, so uh, we can use uh, uh, the uh, piece of surgery in order to extract the uh, apical part, of course, uh, of the of the root which has been fractured, and then the piece of uh, surgery can help us even uh, to identify the correct implant position. At this point, the sequence, the surgical sequence of drilling is absolutely. Uh, normal as we were placing an implant in a pristine uh, bone as we were doing a delayed implant placement but uh, uh, differently from a delayed implant placement here we will have a gap between uh, our implant and the facial aspect of uh, our um, buccal plate so what we need to do is uh, to graft this gap with uh, um, long-term resorption material uh, such as xenograft. But uh, again, uh, the, real, uh, the real key point to me is not to stop here, but uh, to, uh, do, uh, to go a step forward and uh, to uh, place a connected tissue graft which will not function only as a, a, a socket sealing, but it will be uh, pushed on the vestibule part of our uh, implant, of our buccal plate, after the creation of adequate pouch under, um, under the flap. So we will create a small pouch and I'm going to push this connected tissue graft between the facial plate and the pouch I created uh, and then, of course, I'm going to suture this uh, and uh, to make sure that, that this tissue is uh, absolutely stable. Uh, and uh, I'm doing this uh, for two reasons. First of all, because uh, uh, this will increase uh, the vestibule aspect of my, uh, of my uh, implant uh, air area and then because uh, uh, this uh, uh, tissue it will be uh, uh, it will be big enough to uh, gain adequate blood supply in order not to go um, to uh, to necrotize uh, during the, the healing so uh, and you can see after three years uh, we can maintain uh, a acceptable aesthetics uh, with uh, a good uh, uh, mimic of the uh, surrounding uh, uh, of the uh, implant per implant mucosa with the surrounding natural uh, uh, gingiva on the natural dentition adjacent to our implant supported restoration. So in conclusion, in order to summarize again the key factors, uh, here I have another case where you see a fractured central incisor, again number nine. So the key point is automatic extraction, implant position in three dimensional uh, in a three dimensional position with the bone graft, bone substitute material, xenograft, a, a slow resorption time material between the implant and the facial plate. And then again, what I really believe is a key factor is the soft tissue augmentation at the time of the implant placement. And then at this point, the patient go back to our restorative dentist who has to manage and to maintain this GGV architecture. So let me ask Gianluca, at this point that the patient go back to you, what do you, what do you think is a crucial point to maintain the, um, the aesthetics in this and to gain aesthetics with the implant supported yeah, restoration? If we have the opportunity, to, the opportunity to have a lot of tissue to play with, is extremely important that we uh, get advantage of it from day one. So if you look at the picture on the screen, you will definitely notice that in the moment in which Luca inserts the implant and uh, put its, uh, uh, the, the connective uh, uh, tissue graft, I immediately give some pressure with an ovate pontic.
And the ovate pontic is extremely important and it's extremely important that we apply the pressure of the ovate pontic exactly in the moment of the graft. Because in this way we can get advantage of the swelling that happens in the first 24 to 48 hours after the surgical procedure. And so the soft tissue basically swell around an area that is driven by the shape of the ovate pontic. And this is important because this is not a, a, a real pressure because the ovate pontic, in this case a temporary Maryland bridge, is not giving pressure to the site but is basically giving only a guidance for the tissue to develop and to uh, be um, to, to, to develop and to follow the natural shape of the ovate pontic. If we go back into the literature of the ovate pontics on fixed restoration without implant, there is not much difference from the ovate pontic we make over the implant, the only difference is that we go, as you can read on this slide, a little bit less down into the uh, alveolar socket because we have the implant and because we have the uh, tissue graft, we will not go two to three millimeters along the previous root portion of the tooth, but we will basically stop our uh, depth about one to 1.5 millimeters down compared to the um, marginal uh, gingival margin. And uh, it's very important, as you can see, that is a 3D dimensional shape of the ovate pontic, so it's important that we give good pressure, not too much on the facial aspect, enough pressure on the interproximal side, remember the papilla act like water bags, so if we give some pressure right at the uh, green arrows, we will basically guide some maturation of the interproximal uh, papilla and the interproximal soft tissue towards the contact point. And of course, if you look at this patient uh, in the four months after the surgical procedure, so after the implant placement, the patient is extremely comfortable because the patient can speak, uh, the patient can eat, the patient can smile with friends without any problem. So it's extremely comfortable to uh, perform a social life uh, as because he has a good aesthetics, a good function and that while we are doing providing this treatment to the patient we are also providing a treatment for us making our following steps uh, more predictable and more easy. In fact the second important step in which we give uh, basically a, a management to the pre-implants of tissue is the insertion of the provisional restoration that happens four months after or three months now we have uh, fantastic implant surfaces so we can cut down a little bit the timing for the uh, loading of our restorations and of our, our restoration on the implants. So three to four months after the uh, insertion of the implant, we perform the stage two, as Luca mentioned before, and we can insert the provisional restoration like this. And uh, we are still in the timing of procedure A, second part. So we have obeyed pontic one, screw retain provisional restoration two, and uh, uh, is extremely important important in this side that we identify carefully the cement enamel junction of the provisional restoration. So our dental technician will design a provisional restoration with the cement enamel junction that is exactly in the symmetrical position compared to tooth number nine, as you can see on this picture. And uh, we will insert this provisional, try to guide the restoration, and we prefer to utilize a screw retain provisional restoration because with a screw retain provisional restoration, we can manage more easily the emergence profile of the implant restoration that, as you can see, is definitely a little bit under contoured on the facial uh, uh, side and a little bit straight on the interproximal side. We will see some picture later on that will clarify this aspect that to me is extremely important. Our goal in this moment is to copy what is happening on the contralateral tooth. It means on tooth number uh, nine. So we want number eight to be the exact copy of number nine. And uh, mm, in the next two to three months after the insertion of our provisional restoration, we might see a little bit of recession of the facial soft tissue. 
that if we have a lot of tissue normally doesn't change too much. But where we see a huge difference is at the proximal soft tissue level. Because if Luca performed in a proper way the surgical procedure, uh, we can see definitely a, a good maturation of the interproximal papilla towards the contact point. There is a lot of literature down, uh, uh, down there in which is well described the importance of the interproximal bone peak that must be maintained in order to have a good papilla. But in the moment we insert our provisional restoration, we normally see a tendency of the interproximal soft tissue to develop toward the contact point, so to move more coronally, uh, of one even to two millimeters. So this black arrow that we see between our provisional restoration and the adjacent teeth will most probably be filled little by little, so we don't want to rush, we don't want to deliver the final restoration immediately but we prefer to wait at least three months in order to have stable tissues and then transfer this information to the final restoration. So the moment in which we jump into the B step it means the customized impression so the transferring of the clinical information to the dental laboratory uh, we have stable tissues that have been uh, healed for two to three months. And it's extremely important to me that we transfer these informations correctly to our dental technician. So it means that we cannot utilize a stock, tray, stock abutment and stock tray, but we must utilize customized impression coping, as you can see on this slide. It means that we transfer, as you can see on the impression taken with the polyether material, the exact shape of the provisional restorations into the uh, master cast for the definitive restoration. And you can see here, eight months after the extraction of the tooth, we can deliver a restoration that is a copy of the uh, provisional restoration, of course, done in ceramic material. This part is extremely important for me, so be very careful to listen to my words in the next two minutes, because the peri-implant emergence profile make, makes a big difference in the achievement of a good and stable aesthetic, uh, a good and stable aesthetic result. We differentiate two different parts, the facial profile that is identified with the red color and the interproximal profile that is colored by blue. And on the facial aspect, we want to have an under-counter profile. This paper by Rompen is extremely interesting because it's really showing us that if we have an under-counter abutment, uh, we normally see a tendency of the soft tissue to grow more coronally and definitely a tendency not to have any recession. That's why we want to have a profile that remain under-counter on the facial aspect and then go towards the uh, proper uh, cemento enamel position, so to the cervical position of the tooth, right at the end of, uh, of its shape. So it starts very straight, concave, and then start giving pressure only a little bit more coronally. The things are opposite at interproximal level, because if we have under contour abutment interproximally, the papillae lose their support. And you remember when we were talking about the ovate pontic, talking about papillae as a water bag, we lose that support that is present on natural dentition, as you can see on these pictures, and we have normally papillae that are much flatter. Okay, that's why when we deliver our definitive abutment or when we deliver our provisional restoration, we always try to have abutment like this, under contoured on the facial aspect and much straighter on the interproximal level where we want to give some support to the papilla. So if you look at the case, in the future uh, years after cementation, down the line, one year, three years, five years, radiographic examination, and that's at six years, we see that if we perform a proper surgical protocol and a proper prosthetic protocol, we can achieve good aesthetic results that are stable uh, uh, long term. And this is extremely important because we want to see our cases stable and nice from an aesthetic point of view, not only the day of the delivery of the restoration, but also in the future. That is something that to me is extremely important. And uh, I think, Luca, we have a, a, a huge difference between uh, uh, the situation that we just discussed now, in which we have uh, a lot of bone to deal with, and the situation in which we don't have a lot of bone, right? 
Exactly, Gianluca. See, the, the cases we have been uh, so far, the, uh, surgically, they, they were very easy to manage because we had adequate bone and we had adequate uh, soft tissue. The problem really comes when we have extensive resorption of the facial plate or complete absence absence of the facial plate. And another extremely difficult situation is when we are dealing with an atrophic ridge. So um, when we have a complete absence of the facial plate, I normally do not place the implant. If I want to achieve a good aesthetics and uh, a good uh, result, a long-term uh, uh, successful result, I really think we have to uh, manage the case step by step. So uh, at the time of the extraction, uh, if I realize that the facial plate is uh, uh, absent, is completely resorbed, I then decided to perform a technique which calls, it's, it's called socket preservation or socket augmentation. It, 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 it means that I normally fill the, um, the, uh, the deficiency of the bone with the, uh, bone substitute material. In this case, I do not use, uh, like the previous uh, surgical situation, I do not use xenograft or long-term resorption material, but I use um, um, uh, um, so, some materials which are more osteoinductive, uh, um, such as the FDBA, for example, uh, and uh, I use a membrane, which is extremely important for me to use a membrane uh, in a, um, a resorbable membrane, which is a collagen membrane. I uh, prefer porcine collagen membrane, which is uh, uh, normally treated in a way uh, uh, of cross-linking. It means that the barrier membrane, the barrier effect will last four to six months. So you have to pay a, a extremely uh, careful and attention when you select your membrane because uh, uh, you know there are a, a large um, market on the membrane and what we need to look at is the not uh, how uh, long will last the membrane itself, but how long the barrier effect of the membrane will last. So I don't want a material that will last uh, for three to four months, but I want a material that which the barrier effect will last for four to five months. So this is very important and this is uh, different from the type of the cross linkage, of the cross linking of the of the membrane at which will determine the resorption time. So in a cases like this that we have to extract the teeth for a perianendo uh, combined lesion and we have an absolute absence of the facial plate, it will be absolutely not adequate for me to uh, think of uh, placing an immediate implant, uh, post-extraction implant in this case, uh, or to let the, the, the tissue, uh, the bone and the soft tissue heal by itself without perform any type of augmentation. At this point, for me, is uh, the uh, adequate time to, um, uh, uh, to think to perform a bone grafting uh, uh, procedure. So I will use a bone substitute material. I will cover everything with uh, a, a, a cross-linking cross uh, uh, membrane, a collagen cross-linking uh, membrane, and then I approximate my flap, my flap with the internal mattress suture that will uh, hold the membrane to the position and it will keep away the tension from uh, the crystal part of my flap. But I do not need to achieve primary closure with this type of material, with this type of membrane. So I'm not uh, uh, really worried uh, uh, to achieve a primary closure. And then, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, after five months, I exposed the patient with the CBCT. You can see the incredible amount of bone, which is bleeding bone, is a, a bone that will allow me for a correct implant position and uh, a, a adequate bone to maintain and to gain a good aesthetic result and a long-term stability of uh, this uh, uh, prosthesis. Uh, of my um, of my implants, uh, so you can see down the road, even radiographically, we have absolutely stable result uh, of of uh, the regenerate bone around our implant uh, supported restoration. 
A different situation uh, is, uh, of course, when we have uh, an atrophic ridge, because when we, we start from an, atroph an atrophic ridge, it's uh, extremely important to go back to what you were talking about before. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the radiographic stent, which is made by our diagnostic wax up. So it's extremely important to identify from uh, the uh, surgical point of view where the CJ of our final implant supported restoration is going to be and uh, the um, access to the uh, to the screw of our uh, to, of our provisional uh, will be uh, will be placed so these uh, are two important information because it will dictate the angulation of my implants and the apical coronal and the apical coronal position of the implant shoulder uh, related to the planet CJ. So uh, at this point, I know that, uh, uh, for example, in this case, uh, I have uh, an inadequate space uh, from the crystal bone to the planet CJ. So I have to countersink a little bit my implant, uh, a little bit more subcrystal in order to give the space uh, uh, for the implant, for the restorative uh, uh, material, uh, in order to achieve uh, an adequate dimension of our implant supported restoration. And uh, at this, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, radiograph, you can see easily that uh, I could uh, have placed my implant. Uh, in 360 degrees inside the bone without exposing any part of the implant, just uh, changing the angulation of the implant body a little bit more toward the palatal aspect. But if I would have done this, I would have compromised the exact and the optimal implant position. So I prefer uh, in this case not to change the implant position, but to plan for a guided bone re regeneration procedure on the facial aspect of this implant. So uh, surgically, after I elevated my full thickness flap, of course, I'm going to place the implant in the ideal three-dimensional guided position, which is guided from the prosthetic point of view. And uh, as uh, I was expecting, because I anticipated this uh, from my diagnosis and uh, the uh, view of my, um, of my CBCT, I knew that a part of the implant, of the facial aspect of this, of this implant, uh, was going to be exposed because of the bone deficiency that we have uh, on uh, the vestibule, on the buccal aspect of this implant. So I am planning to go for a, a guided bone re regeneration procedure, which will be performed uh, with uh, um, FDBA materials and cover with a collagen uh, long-term uh, resorption time uh, membrane, with the, so a cross-link collagen membrane, which will be uh, placed over my, my bone substitute material and it will be held in place with the suture. Uh, the suture will help me to stabilize the membrane and to achieve a primary closure in, this, uh, in these cases. At this point, after, of course, uh, um, about five months, I can go ahead and uh, just create a small pouch in order to expose my implant and then we can see the final uh, uh, aesthetic result which we were able to maintain uh, good aesthetics and to restore an adequate gingival architecture in order to mimic perfectly the contralateral central incisor on this uh, young uh, patient. So once we have uh, identify the clinical situation where we have or we do not have the bone, we realize that clinically and surgically we have two different ways to manage the cases. But once we have adequate bone and adequate soft tissue, then Gianluca has the ability to manage this tissue correctly and to um, transport all the information that you have mentioned with your provisional to the final restoration. So. Well, what what do you have to say about this? No, I think that in this moment we are like uh, uh, wrapping up all what we did surgically and prosthetically into the final restoration, and we have to give uh, uh, a lot of attention to what is the uh, the material of the final restoration, and uh, we have in the market a lot of informations, a lot of material that the different companies are providing us with uh, supposed great advantages for us. As clinician but we need to be extremely careful about their impact on the bone and on the soft tissue. 
we have a lot of studies and I believe that this is one of the most interesting one done by the Swedish group that is telling us that biologically we want to utilize materials such as titanium or zirconium oxide that are providing a good soft and especially hard tissue stability compared compare to the materials such as uh, gold alloy uh, that were utilized mostly in the past and now are utilizing much less. Clinically, this paper by Paolo Vigolo is telling us that there is not much difference, but we have to keep in mind the histologic result, still understanding that clinically we don't see much differences in terms of plaque accumulation, keratinized uh, gingiva and uh, gingival uh, inflammation or bleeding on probing around implants when we, uti we utilize um, gold alloy or titanium uh, abutment. We actually in the University of Padova with our research team ran a lot of research on the static implants on, of the different types of abutment into the uh, color, especially the shade of the perimplant soft tissue. And we understand that the shade of the uh, abutment is also playing a significant role. So we have to be careful about the shape as we mentioned before, but also about the shade of the abutments. And when we think about titanium, that is an extremely grayish material, we know that this material is not the best material in the static zone because the grayness of the abutment might appear through the soft tissue, especially when we have not much uh, thick material. So titanium is good only when we have situations with thick tissue facially to the implant. So all what Luca explained before on all of what we discussed about implant position and soft tissue augmentation is important to give us freedom in the material selection. But if we end up in a situation in which we don't have much tissue on the facial aspect of the implant, we will be much safer selecting materials such as zirconium oxide or gold alloy eventually that has a yellowish material that can give some warm color and some good natural aesthetic result at the end of the case. Of course, as mentioned, the thickness of the tissue make a crucial uh, uh, impact on the result. As, as uh, Young is telling us, when we have more than two millimeters of facial soft tissue facially to the implant head, we don't see much differences. The problems start and happens when we have less than two millimeter thickness. So if we want to summarize the end result of the prosthetic impact on the aesthetic zone implant, we would definitely say that we can utilize in the aesthetic zone material such as titanium when we have thick tissue. So more than two millimeters of thickness of the facial tissue on the facial aspect of the implant. Or of course, we want to utilize them where, when we are utilizing extended cases, multiple unit case where we have a significant impact on the uh, uh, structural durability of our prosthesis. On the other side, if we are doing single unit cases, like the one we discussed in this presentation, especially when we have a thinner tissue, so two millimeters thickness or less, we want to utilize uh, more uh, in the aesthetic zone, uh, more with, with, more, uh, uh, with better aesthetic results, uh, abutment made up of zirconium oxide or recently uh, lithium desilicate material that are whiter and have a good impact on the final aesthetic results that definitely is much more uh, natural. But when we are having extended cases that are involving multiple units, so three, four, five, or even full arch implant supported restoration, I would be extremely careful in utilizing this material because it might not be the best choice long term. Last consideration about abutments is extremely important that we normally select when we are on the right side of the screen, so with the whiter material, abutments that are white but still have a titanium connector because this can give much more strength and accuracy of our restoration and most probably uh, long term stability. And I think now we arrive at the end of our presentation. We try to condense and touch a lot of informations and I'm sure we can go deeper into many of them and uh, 
I think that uh, we will uh, wait for you for future presentation, future lecture, trying to focus in deeper in uh, many of the topics uh, that we discussed today. Right, Luca? Well, absolutely. I thank you very much for your kind attention and I hope you enjoyed this uh, small and uh, powerful presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and see you soon.